is Marianne Ross Amar, and I am the Vice President of Trading and Securities at Sterling Asset Management. This evening, I have either the pleasure or the misfortune of moderating a panel discussion this evening. Uh, we as a very special welcome, sorry, I missed start, a very special welcome to our listeners on Nationwide News. We are live on the radio tonight, so I'm asking the crowd to be well behaved in the Q&A section. Tonight, we'll be discussing the topic, rate cuts, recession, market correction. What is next for investors? We'll have a 40-minute discussion, followed by some Q&A, questions and answers. Giving us their best crystal ball insights this evening are our three panelists. And if you'll give me a few minutes, I'll start by introducing them. So I'll, I'm waiting for one to come up on the screen, but I'll start with those of us in person first. To my furthest left is Mr. Keith Collister. Keith is no stranger to some of you here. As you know, he's a leading financial journalist and commentator with a background in economics and finance. He's been to some of the best schools the UK has to offer. His bio is very extensive, so I don't think we could get, it, get through all of it tonight. So I'll just uh, summarize it by saying, Keith is executive chairman at ATL Pension Fund. He's a board director at EPLI, and he's also actively involved in the Economic Affairs Committees at the JCC and the PSOJ. We're all very grateful for his involvement. For those of you who don't know, Keith is very frequently contacted by global rating agencies, global investment banks, and in fact, major, major multilaterals about the Jamaican economy. So we figured that we should get his view here as well. So Keith, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And next in line is Mr. Charles Ross, our president and founder. Charles actually spent 15 years of his life as a civil engineer, building schools, houses, and water infrastructure across the island. But after experiencing his first recession in the construction industry, he realized he needed to switch jobs. So he founded Sterling a little over 24 years ago with the goal of bringing safer, higher yielding, and higher quality investments to the region. And his role, in his role as president for the past 20 years or 24 years, the company has generated a return on equity in excess of 20% per annum. So Charles will be sharing his insights from his perspective as an investor. And last but certainly not least is our panelist joining for, via Zoom, Mr. Henry Mooney. Okay, great. Here he is. Hi, Henry. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Henry. So just a quick intro on Henry. Henry is the principal economist and senior advisor within the Caribbean Country Department at the IDB. Henry has over 20 years of experience across both the private and multilateral sectors. He's worked in dozen of, dozens of countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Henry is also a widely published author. You can find his articles in The Economist, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Reuters, and dozens of other media outlets. So Henry, we're very happy to have you join us here today. Thank you. So before we get into the questions, I just wanted to frame the discussion briefly, um, try to provide a very brief discussion, a description of the environment we're in and some of the most frequently questions frequently asked questions we get from investors. It's no secret, as Charles mentioned, as we can all see, the environment around us is changing. We're moving from a higher interest rate type monetary policy regime globally to a looser one. Um, even the Bank of Jamaica is lowering rates. So a central theme in our discussion that I'd like to pose and frame to our panelists is how do we position ourselves? How do investors position themselves to ensure that these changes benefit them? So I'd just like you to bear that in mind as we speak to the listeners and the audience here tonight. Um, as I mentioned to Keith, initially we'll start with the macro and work our way down to the micro. So my first question, and I guess I will start with, um, me, uh, I guess, Henry, since you're the foreigner, and my first question is on the US economy, I'll start with you. My first question, 
What does the growth and health of the U.S. economy look like in the next year? So thanks very much. Again, I hope you can hear me. Please let me know if you can't. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, as mentioned, it's great to see, by the way, Keith Collister there, who I've known for several years uh, and have worked with in the past and continue to work with. Uh, so just, just before I say anything, let me uh, preface everything by saying, while I do work for the Inter-American Development Bank, the, any views that I express tonight are my own, not that of my employer. Uh, that said, uh, and currently I'm working on the Caribbean primarily, so I'm not focused exclusively on looking at advanced economies like the U.S. and its growth, uh, though I have done that in the past. Uh, in fact, I was once a central banker. I worked for Canada Central Bank. So I have some some insights, at least, uh, into the, the central banking uh, dilemma that uh, we have all been discussing for, for several years uh, and that is starting to... Um, you know, become become a, a more interesting story. I mean, look, I, I think probably the best uh, the best answer to a question like this is to talk a little bit about what we're seeing this past week in terms of the Fed policy rate change. Uh, I think I think that's probably the most consequential uh, point of departure here. I mean, I think uh, as has been discussed before, I was listening in uh, earlier on. The Fed came out with a the last week with a fifty basis point adjustment, uh, which uh, in many respects, is quite surprising. It's an outsized adjustment. Uh, 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 most people would, uh, you know, most commentators thought that we were going to expect a 25 basis point uh, adjustment, which historically was the increment uh, that the the Fed had used in in relatively normal times in terms of policy uh, adjustment, one direction or another. I think the 50 basis point change tells us something in itself. It's an outsized move even though the Fed has come out and gone to great lengths to tell us that that should not be seen as the new pace of adjustment, that it was just the first move. I think what it tells us is the Fed acknowledges that it's slightly behind the curve, right? And in, in as much as it's there's an inflection point, it's no longer focused on one of its two pillars, uh, two pillar mandate, which is price stability. Uh, clearly, it is of the opinion that inflation has been tamed, all other things equal. And that it now must shift focus to its second pillar, uh, which is uh, full employment, right? So I think the 50 basis point uh, adjustment tells you something right there, that obviously the Fed has decided that uh, focusing on uh, maintaining an economy that is robust uh, uh, is, is where uh, it needs to focus. I think uh, so. I think that 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 really is probably the most telling sign that we have uh, currently in terms of, of what we're seeing. Uh, that the Fed itself is acknowledging that actually the, the economy is now the new focus going forward. Now, uh, of course, being a central banker is an exceedingly difficult job uh, uh, and one that is, uh, you know, where, where central bankers are blamed for inflation, for booms and busts, for financial crises, for recessions, uh, where they are certainly not in control of all of the factors that, that underpin that. So I would say looking forward, uh, one, one set of question marks that will have an influence on the U.S. economic performance going forward is going to be the uncertainty around the upcoming election, for example, and what that's going to mean for fiscal policy. Obviously, uh, in the next year or two, uh, the, the path of U.S. economic policy is going to be uh, significantly influenced by what the outcome in November, uh, whether that's tax policy, expenditure policy, investment policy. I think that these are all key issues that uh, that we don't know enough about now, we don't have enough certainty about now. Um, but I think that uh, from the investor point of view, from the market's point of view, uh, that 50 point basis point uh, reduction easing by the Fed uh, is really pointing to the fact that the economy, while it continues to perform, uh, is now the focus of attention uh, and that it's going to need some stimulus in order to continue uh, in this Goldilocks path that we seem to be in, which is a soft or no landing scenario. So most people are saying soft landing, which means uh, no recession. I think you can al also argue it's a no landing scenario where the plane comes close to the runway, but then accelerates and takes off again. Um, but I think that that's, that's really where we are. Thanks, Henry. So if I'm getting it correctly, I think you're in the soft landing camp. I think uh, yes. I would I would put myself in the soft landing cap. I don't see a recession coming, but I certainly do see risks on the horizon to the economy that the Fed is trying to get ahead of. 
okay, with, this outsize, with this outsize move of 50, uh, 50 basis points. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. I'm hoping we have at least one contradicting view in person on the panel. Um, Keith, uh, would you like to go next? Where do you see the U.S. economy in the next year? Hard or soft landing? I think I'm in the soft landing camp like Henry. Um, you know, clearly the economy is decelerating a bit. Um, you're seeing that in the hiring, some of the em employment numbers, and so on. However, um, you know, there's something called the SAM rule, which supposedly says if if un the unemployment rate goes up 50 basis points, then maybe you have a you know a proper recession. I I think that's not really the case at this time, because I think, you know, it seems like this time is different. I mean, you, you have to be very careful saying that, of course, but it does seem like, you know, you're, you've come off an unusual um, COVID-induced recession. You've, you've had an unusual job market. Uh, how how would I, I would characterize it is that and this is something that we internally at ATL Pension Fund, we've been thinking for a number of years. You, had a, you have a situation in the US where the COVID created a decline in the consumer, the, the um, services portion of the economy. And you had a, an increase in the amount of goods purchased. So I'm trying to make this quite simple, but so you've, you've had a recovery now in the services economy, you know, reach out and touch. Tourism is a good example. And um, actually that's one of the things that's allowed one to see this very clearly being in the tourist sector and, and looking at US consumer dem demand. So, so you've had that uh, recovery in the services sector You've had a you know a weakish um, goods sector now in the U.S. for a while, but the, the basically the services sector is much bigger, way bigger than the manufacturing or goods sector in the in the United States, and so the recovery has continued. And if you you also combine that with the fact that you've had this huge fiscal stimulus you know, de uh, fiscal deficit of 6%, uh, you know, other countries hit a constraint such as Jamaica way earlier than the US will. And not to say they can never hit a constraint by the way, but probably it's not quite, it's not yet. So, so if you combine those two things, I think that suggests that, uh, you know, we're still in the soft landing, um, period of, of the economy in the US. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to mention is that how, whilst I've said that, you know, this is where we are, clearly the economy is softening. You can also see that in, again, I'm using the US consumer demand and talking specifically about tourism. One is seeing that now in, and so, so I do think that you're in a, in a soft economy period and I do think the Fed, I actually wasn't, I should have written this, by the way, but I actually wasn't very surprised that they cut 50 basis points simply because I thought they were, they're, they're late. The Fed is late, but it's not too late. It's, it's only a, a few months late. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not terminal, and I don't think it means that the U.S. is about to go into recession. It just means that they probably should have cut a little earlier. So that would be my quick comment there. Hopefully that's in line with what Henry <laughs> thinks too. I like that perspective a lot, Keith. I would, I would actually add that, you know, delaying for sure has had in, impacts. I like the point you made that, you know, the imp you're seeing the impact on tourism. I think maybe for other reasons as well, um, technology and otherwise, we're seeing an impact on the global services industry as well. And it's a nice pivot into the, my next question. Charles, I'm cheating you on the first question because you told us that you, you already told us you're pro soft landing, but maybe you can tell us kind of um, how, how do we think that the outcome in the U.S. not election, the, the, the U.S. economic outcome will affect Jamaica. 
and the Jamaican economy? Well, yep. Well, you know, the, the old saying is that um, if the US sneezes, we catch a cold. So tourism is our largest industry. 70% of our visitors come from the US. So for sure, it will affect us. The next largest source of foreign exchange is remittances. Uh, if there is rising unemployment in the States, uh, if the economy softens, I guess it'll affect our brothers and sisters that live over there and it may affect remittances. So uh, for sure, a weakening US economy uh, would not be good news for Jamaica. Uh, now, the, the, the question about, you know, it, will it be different this time? I think that's probably one of the big questions. Yes, at the moment, everything does look like a soft landing is the most likely outcome, but uh, monetary policy does work with long lags. So the jury is still out. You know, we have to see what happens over the next uh, 12 months or so. Thanks. Henry, do you have a perspective on that? How the outcome of the, uh, how, how the behavior of the US economy would affect us, your, your outlook for the Jamaican economy? Sure. I mean, I, I think just echoing what, what we just heard. Uh, in fact, at the IDB, we did do a lot of work during COVID in particular, looking at the impact, you know, the, the, the significance, for example, of the tourism sector, both directly and indirectly, uh, not just for Jamaica, but for countries across the Caribbean. So, so absolutely. Uh, when, when, if and when demand uh, for that product, uh, for those services declines, that, that could have a significant uh, implication. So again, it hinges on the degree to which you think the U.S. economy is going to soften. Uh, so, I mean, time will tell. Uh, time will tell. I mean, I think from my perspective, you know, the, the performance of the U.S. economy and how policies adjust in the U.S. over the next couple of years, I mean, I think there's another dimension that goes beyond just the near-term impact of short-term interest rate changes, uh, uh, you know, the, the beginning of the easing cycle for the Fed. Um, I think one story, and I, maybe we come back to this at, at some later point in a, in, in a different context, but I think one story that I, that is going to be important for developing emerging economies uh, like Jamaica coming, you know, in the future is, you know, we, we know where we started. Uh, we know what the Fed just did. We know what the dot plots are telegraphing to us over the next 24 months. Um, but, you know, the, the new neutral interest rate in the United States is probably going to look quite different assuming everything, uh, you know, goes to plan than, uh, than what we have become accustomed to over the course of the last decade, right? I mean, we have, have been in the low for long uh, since the great financial crisis uh, uh, environment where, where markets, investors, balance sheets have become accustomed to near zero interest rates uh, uh, for various reasons, you know, responding to crises and alike. Um, but I think What's probably going to happen, what is most more likely to happen is that we get back to a more normal interest rate environment where the Fed's neutral interest rate is somewhere in the three to four percent range, right? Which is what the dot plots are telling us and what history tells us. If we look back back before the great financial crisis, uh, uh, you know, historically, that's where it was. And I think emerging markets have, have benefited tremendously from the search for yield driven by the low for long phenomenon or, or lack of yield in safe assets like the US Treasury. So I think in a year or two, when things you know, start to shake out, there is where I have some, some, some thoughts some concerns about you know, where we end up uh, with you know, a, a relatively robust real yield in the United States for safe assets like treasuries and Amer you know, US equities, US fixed income instruments. Wh where does that leave the rest of the world, uh, especially emerging markets that have benefited tremendously from these capital flows linked to the low for long uh, and lack of, of real positive yields in the United States and other advanced economies. So that's so that that's you know a slightly different question, but I think that that has to do with the you know the the prospects for performance of the US economy uh, in steady state uh, and 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 that will be a different environment from the one we have become accustomed to in the last decade. Thanks, Henry. Um, you raised some really good points there. And I guess maybe the the first 
question I would ask, and maybe I would ask this to Charles, is would a higher neutral Fed rate be a net positive for investors who are looking for yield? Uh, now that rates would, are, are, are in theory, would be higher. I mean, assuming spreads don't go any tighter, but would you say that's a positive for investors going forward? A higher, a higher range of Fed funds rate would investors here be able to to seek higher, to access higher yields? Uh, well, for sure, uh, investors would love to get higher yields. So, uh, if interest rates don't go back to zero, or you know back as low as they have in the past, recent past, that would be good. But on the other hand, um, higher interest rates will have a dampening effect on investment and uh, economic activity. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, but for sure, for the fixed income investor, yeah, bring on the higher rates, I guess. So just pivoting back to the macro in that case, Keith, you mentioned that you, we were already, Jamaica had already maybe started to feel some of the softness that uh, the US economy was experiencing. So my wild card question to you is, is the Bank of Jamaica easing fast enough based on the softening in the US as well as what's going on here? Well, my view is that the Bank of Jamaica is a little later than the uh, than the Fed, so the way I would look at it is that you know the business people and this and Richard Richard Biles actually said this in his meeting. You started to see signs when you spoke to the business people from about March, let's call it, that uh, and this is his own words, but I agree with him. Um, you know that the economy was softening here. So you've had a, a Q2 that I think the projection or maybe it's the final version, which is basically flat. You've got them projecting for the full year, you know, a possible negative, uh, the, the full fiscal year, a possible negative number. And, you know, if you think, of, if you look at it on a sectoral basis, you'll see, as I said, tourism starting to, flatten and maybe we'll see if it actually goes down but certainly flattening your your, your the post covid covid recovery which was sharp has ended it, it 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 you know you saw it right up to the end of last year really but at least for jamaica and some caribbean islands it continued right but um and jamaica has men bahamas may have had some special factors in terms of traveling warnings warnings but it looks it's starting to look more general in my view that the that you're seeing a sort of flattening on the on the US consumer demand tourism driven front. And um, so basically I would say you look at the construction sector here, started we it's it's really down from last year. BPO, which is another major supplier, well user of labor and also, you know, a reasonable significant FX earnings is, looks like it's, uh, you know, no longer expanding. Um, so manufacturing uh, similarly is, is kind of weakish. So basically you look like an economy that is sort of stagnating and, and returning to this, our let's call it our traditional, <laughs> one to two percent of economic growth and that's the good scenario that's actually probably not the scenario that we're facing in the in the very short term over the next few quarters they're probably closer to stall uh, which is why i believe the boj needs to cut to take advantage of the um the cut in the, the clear signal from the us that they're cutting rates i think that we should cut rates a little bit faster right. than than the us but, you know, so I understand that they want to keep some level of, of parity there. But in my view, we have we, our economy is weaker than the U.S. is. And therefore, we need, we need sharper cuts, just as we had sharper, a sharper rise going up. I think we need a, a slightly sharper cut going going down. So that's my view on that. I like that perspective, Keith. Thank you. 
Uh, Charles, as the only other Jamaican, <laughs> quote unquote, in the room, would you like to comment on if the Bank of Jamaica is, you know, easing fast enough? Be careful, we have someone here from the Bank of Jamaica. I, I didn't well, warn Keith. Well, you just told me now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't warn Keith. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I'm a little confused by uh, official interest rate policy here because there's so much variation between the quote-unquote policy rate, uh, the 30-day CD rate, the T-bill rate, the yields on longer term securities. Uh, for sure, the Jamaican economy at the best of times uh, is barely um, growing. And uh, from what Keith says, we are experiencing uh, a softening even of that very um, anemic growth. So uh, I don't know, it, it, it all depends too on inflation. We ha we're having a pickup in local inflation. Um, is that really the right time to start easing interest rates? You know, I, I don't know. At the end of the day, too, it's not just about interest rates. It's about liquidity and the rate at which that liquidity is growing. Uh, and again, it's very difficult to really put your finger on um, what exactly the policy position of the central bank is because they will do both things at the same time, inject liquidity and remove it. So it's, it's, uh, I'm just very confused and I don't know if it's a very simple call. Okay, fair. I do wanna make a quick comment. Um, the, there is, you, you, the justification they used when inflation went to 5%, which was the previous uh, month or so, um, I think it's 5.1, was because, so that was a reason why, why they justified the, the, the recent cut. Now, of course, it's gone, it's spiked up to 6.5, but, and I think they're right, that was meant to be because of barrel and the impact on food items and so on. So in my view, and no doubt Henry can speak about this, but I think the IMF agrees that these type of um, shocks that are coming from you know, this type of scenario, in this case, a hurricane, you know, we can, you, I think the, I agree with the BOJ taking the view that, okay, this will pass three to five months. So we look through that because that's basically a specific thing that has happened that has caused this rise in, in um, right. inflation, which is basically local food items getting destroyed during a hurricane. Fair. Henry, any thoughts uh, before I move on, on on how the Jamaican economy is faring and how our monetary policy is responding to the changes elsewhere? Uh, no, I mean, just in, in agreement. I mean, I think to the last point Keith made, absolutely, as, as a former central banker myself, uh, you know, transitory shocks are not something that, uh, you know, need to be uh, addressed uh, with monetary policy, certainly one that has long and variable lags, as we understand, right? So, so the, I think on that front, certainly the Bank of Jamaica was justified. Uh you know, back to another point made earlier, I think by Keith, I mean, uh, just to, to, to underscore the point of, of uh, you know, the growth path in Jamaica, you know, I, I, I actually looked at this earlier on uh, for another publication I was working on. I mean, really, you know, the COVID shock was significant and, and it was only at the end of 2023 that real GDP came back to end 2019 levels in Jamaica, right? So yes, we had several years of of a very strong growth, but we only really just got back to the, the high watermark of 2019 uh, at the end of last year. So uh, we are sort of returning, uh, as mentioned, to a more normal growth path. And I think, you know, monetary policy is, is you know, designed to, uh, you know, keep things in balance, uh, demand and supply, uh, uh, internally, but it, it it doesn't necessarily change the fundamentals of economic uh, growth potential, right? I think for Jamaica to get beyond that one percent a year, uh, reach its full potential, and then beyond, you know, what we what we we need to think about is longer term 
uh, structural change, right, to make the economy uh, grow faster. And that's going to be a function of, you know, more investment in productive sectors uh, and other kinds of realignments realign uh, that, that really have not been the story of the last couple of years. So looking forward, hopefully the best we can do is get to a place where the government's fiscal policy uh, continues to get to a place where fiscal space uh, after you reach the debt target uh, is abundant uh, and, and that you have stability in the private sector can invest uh, more uh, in, in in productive sectors that can help grow the economy. So monetary policy, I think, is, you know, back to a point I made earlier, but central bankers, uh, it's a tough job, you know, because you a lot is put on your shoulders and you have very few instruments and there are a lot of things that are out of your control, uh, you, you know, and I think uh, that this is one of those instances. It's not really down to the central bank. Thank you, Henry. If I didn't know better, I would have thought you worked at the Bank of Jamaica in a former life. I'll, uh, before I have a, one last question, but I'll give Charles, Charles, did you want to say something in response to uh, Henry's point of monetary policy versus structural change? Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm a non-economist, let me say that. And I don't buy the structural argument at all. Uh, I think it's a cop-out, um, which they, some economists use when they can't really put their finger on the problem. But uh, I, I think that our problem really is our mix of, of uh, macroeconomic policy. Um, it seems to me that in Jamaica, we've resisted the notion that market economic theory applies in Jamaica. And we don't believe in allowing market forces to set prices and for the market to direct investment into profitable sectors. Um, as a result, we've had 50 years of economic stagnation. So I really do hope that at some point we buy into uh, traditional market economic theory and start constructing our policies uh, in conformity with that. Thanks, Charles. That's the whole, that's a debate for another <laughs> panel discussion. Keith, if you really feel very strongly about it, I'll give you the final say. <laughs> before I have my last question. Um, no, no, I don't feel super strong about it. I just, uh, and I largely agree with Charles, you know, but we, we haven't got all, our, all the market muscles, if you want to call that, that we should have in the Jamaican economy. The only, the only thing I would say is I do think structural change, you know, is actually important because I think what we need to do, uh, and this actually reflects a view. Charles remembers a gentleman called Donald Harris who wrote a book on export-led growth. Um, and the IDB had an economist called Ricardo Hausman, who was their former chief economist, who updated that in my, I think it's an update, and called it growth diagnostics. And basically, a key part of that is you, his point was you are what you export. And Jamaica's, unfortunately, I don't think it's a coincidence that we kind of export what we did 50 years ago, and then, and now we're we're kind of you know where we are, which is not very far. So 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 I I think it's it's, and I, I do agree as I wanted to say to Henry, I do agree that the bank the central bank has a difficult job, and it can't really solve all the problems, absolutely can't solve all the problems. So I do have great sympathy for the Bank of Jamaica, and in fact. You know, they've had a very tough, going through COVID is a pretty tough uh, stress test. So I think they've done a pretty good job overall. It's just, I have a, a little bit of issues on ti timing and, and things that minor, relatively minor things. I don't think they've done a bad job. <laughs> just, 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 just so they know. <laughs> and I'm not saying because they can hear me, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, all right. My last question before we open it up, just something a takeaway for investors could everyone choose one asset class that they think will stand to benefit the most from the reduction in interest rates in the u.s and what maybe you take one pick in the u.s and one pick in jamaica one asset class each uh, i'll maybe i'll take the opportunity to start um i do think that the tight monetary policy here in jamaica has depressed the local stock market. 
um, in a significant way over the last couple of years, both interest rate rate wise, but also as much from a liquidity standpoint. We've had very tight liquidity here for the last couple of years. So they've kind of used the tight liquidity to target the exchange rate to some degree. Now, again, whilst I have sympathy for what they're trying to achieve, I think you have to be very cautious about that as a long-term strategy. So fortunately in Jamaica's case, unlike in the past, which Charles is very familiar with, we're not running a, you know, we kind of got current account balance, which means that with, with including remittances, mind you, but still. Um, so that means we're spending as much as we earn. So we're not, you know, in 2008, we had a, a current account deficit of 20% of GDP. So you, you, we had everything going wrong, you know, literally literal disaster, right? Um, you know, it was an extraordinarily tough situation. And, you know, I, at some point, I think the IDB is going to rise it up properly, right, uh, right Henry? Um, anyway, so basically, I would think, although it may not be immediate, because I think they're going to have to reduce interest rates for you know, somewhat significantly for that to happen. But at some point, I would expect the financial stocks, which are the predominant, um, you know, the most of the market, at some point, I would expect them to out, you know, recover from, because they haven't really recovered from COVID. Right. And, and that, you know, so, and of course, some of the manufacturing companies, which are reasonably well, reasonable, there's a few that are a little cheap, but they're not. There's no outstanding bargains in the local stock market, so I'm not. Okay. I'm not sort of banging. In, in, twice in my life, I've banged the table and said the stock market is going to double. Uh, and twice in my life, I got it right. Fortunately, <laughs> one one time, my father was in the audience, so I was very happy about that. <laughs> um, but I'm not saying that at this moment in time because we're not got a super cheap market in the U.S. There's some people who think that, and I'll stay with stocks because I'll leave you guys with the bonds because you're the, the bond <laughs> gurus. Um, you know, I have, whilst I think the US has a soft landing scenario, which is positive, they also have pretty high stock prices. So, so you, have to, that, you have to remember that. And you also have to remember that a lot of the AI, a lot of this is AI generated. So it kind of looks a little bit bubblish. Um, now, not to say that AI will not have a dramatic impact longer term, but they've kind of, in many cases, they look like they've anticipated that longer term already. So, you, so, so it kind of reminds me a little bit, not in, it's not entirely uh, reminiscent because there are differences, but it, but it reminds you a little bit of 2000 in the US. So you have to be a little careful, but also, but you know, a positive interest rate cuts and an economy that doesn't fall off a cliff should nevertheless be reasonably positive for the U.S. stock market. So you still, you, you know, you still probably got a. But you, it, I wouldn't expect super returns in either, but you know, you, you should see probably on a sort of medium-term outlook something you know positive, and it may it may actually produce more than a than bonds, which is what it's supposed to do. It may. I'm not saying it will. It may. Because they're not, because in both cases, the Jamaica stock market is a little, it's a little depressed still, and I don't necessarily expect, you know, so an instant turnaround. And on the U.S. side, they're already, it's already had a pretty good run, so it's not, it's not cheap. So that, that, I'll, I'll leave, as I said, I'll leave the bond stuff to you guys because you spend more time on it than me. I like that summary, Keith. Thank you. Uh, stock, it, local stock market. But U.S. stock market expensive, but um, but could deliver positive returns in the medium term. Charles, what's your one asset class pick? <laughs> we shouldn't have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, bonds certainly will will, will do well. Uh, it's, it's sort of axiomatic that if uh, yields fall, prices go up. Uh, the real challenge will be you know, picking the best um, opportunities that are out there in terms of credit quality. But certainly now is the time, I think, to go longer dated, 
and uh, look for some price appreciation in the year or two to come. And Henry, what about you? Sure. I mean, again, I'm not in the business of of, of uh, professional investing, uh, so uh, so with that caveat, I mean, uh, you know, I also agree. I, I'm I'm st I am also uh, always surprised at the, when I look at things like the PE ratio for the U.S. S and P 500, and it's near 30 right now, uh, and it has remained in that range. Uh, you know, it's it's done extremely well uh, very recently, certainly including in the last week. Uh, but you know the, the mar markets have remained pretty frothy throughout the last couple of years, even with very high interest rates. You would expect them to do even better with lower rates, but uh, you know I'm not sure where they can go from here, uh, with the exception of some obviously places AI uh, linked stories, uh, which are also very you know the valuations are quite high, but uh, you know at least there's some prospect of acceleration there. Um, in terms of fixed income, obviously longer duration uh, assets uh, are, are are looking good right now. But again, I, you know, I, uh, and we still have an inverted yield curve, right? So uh, uh, there are lots of spots on the curve that you could pick uh, that 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 might be attractive, with depending uh, rate reductions. But again, I think you know the the rates are not everything, right? I mean, the longer term story is extremely important, and I think. You know, we are all sort of uh, consensus that we're going to have a the Goldilocks scenario, soft landing. But there's a lot of risks still out there, uh, and I think uh, you know uh, there is uncertainty, and and that's really what needs to drive investment decisions in the long run. Uh, and also the other thing that I mentioned, which I, you know, where do we end up, right? What is neutral now? Uh, where do, where does where do the Fed funds rate and uh, where do interest rates end up even in relatively normal you know, context in terms of uh, macro performance? And I think, uh, you know, we're certainly not going to get back down to zero unless there's some kind of global catastrophe again, which may well happen. We've seen two of them in the last decade uh, or so. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think it's it's a challenging environment, but I think things are looking good uh, in relative terms uh, to what we thought might happen a year ago. Um, but I think it's it's still worthwhile being somewhat cautious about uh, about what we expect to happen in the next uh, uh, three to six months because I think uh, there are a lot of key issues that that still have to play and play themselves out. Thanks, Henry. All right, so I'm going to open it up to the floor for Q and A from the audience. I believe we have a roving microphone. And if you would just raise your hand. Okay, great, thank you. And state your name and question. Good evening, I'm Lucy Eanes. And with regards to what Mr. Collister said about the Bank of Jamaica having a real difficult time making decision, I can appreciate that because while I understand that it is good to have low interest rates, which, is, which will be great for investors, how will that affect the Jamaican dollar to the US dollar? What will happen then? She said Jamaican dollar? Mrs. Eanes, you mean the interest the, Jam rates. the interest, the, 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 the US rates. The exchange rate? The exchange rate. Right, right. Okay, okay how will uh, lower rates? Yeah, I'm glad somebody asked that because it's the obvious one. Um, I, I think less than you would think is the answer. And the, and the reason is because what the market here, it seems, well, first of all, we got an unusually large amount of foreign exchange reserves. It's not where we haven't been in, we've never been actually in this position. Um, and secondly, the current account, as I said earlier, which is what we spend versus what we, are, what we earn, is actually in rough balance, which is again situa a situation which we haven't necessarily been in the past. In fact, most of the time we haven't been in that. It's very rare for us to have been in that situation. Now, it is true that the Bank of Jamaica has been part of the reason I believe that they have tightened the um, 
in particular they tighten liquidity is um, you know, partly to influence the price of the Jamaican dollar. And in, in what they seem to be doing, and again, I think there's, you know, I have sympathy to what they're trying to achieve, is they seem to be saying, all right, we will have a, you know, a band in which the dollar will, will trade. Um, I think the band is probably three or four percent a year. It is, re it is reasonable you know, cycle a bit in that band. And what they're trying to do is, to the degree that they're trying to smooth the volatility of the dollar, and, you know, the people talk about what is the right level, how much are you, can you, should you allow the dollar to move? And people get very uncomfortable in Jamaica very quickly when the dollar moves. But if you actually look at it over the last few years, yeah, you know, on a net basis at the end, you know, if you looked at it at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, it really hasn't depreciated very much. Sometimes it goes up a few points more, which it, I think it's been doing that recently. But, and that's, you know, and that's because there's not a shortage of dollars uh, as they are in the, in the past. The BOJ has sufficient dollars available to, to and they have been intervening over the last few, few days to, 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 to smooth it out. The government is not, you know, uh, so, so my basic point is the interest, the interest rate itself between say the US Fed and Jamaica is, you know, is not as important into determining what happens to the dollar as it used to be. And also, we, you know, we dropped interest rates. Some people will remember before the crisis, we dropped them to half a percent, and the Fed was at a quarter of one percent, and we weren't doing all the quantitative easing and putting the liquidity into the system in the same way the Fed was doing at the, at that time. So, yet we managed to have a relatively the same relative stability in that period um, without, you know. The dollar collapsing or anything. So I think we're in a new period of relative macro stability, which obviously we want to retain. You know, we're balancing the budget. So that's another thing. You know, we're, we're still running a balanced budget, which was not true for literally decades. And worse when you consider all the off-budget stuff that you then had to add on uh, the extra debt that would come on every year. So, so we have had a, an unusual period of macro stability, which up to this point continues. And if you have macro stability, then it, you have to worry less about things like, you know, all right, is the interest rate a quarter point or a half point, or is it moves at one or 2% because people have a relative degree of confidence. Now, we, we do want to know who the next finance, finance minister is. Uh, I, I asked Charles, but he, he claimed he didn't know. <laughs> And I don't know, just in case anybody was wondering. So, so you know, there is that. Um, so, so, but I would say that I, I don't think that we should be as concerned as in the past that, you know, cuts in interest rates or even, you know, relax. They've already relaxed the tightening of liquidity. It's actually happened already. So the only thing they haven't done is the formal signal cut of of, in, of an interest rate, I would argue if, if you know, probably the, the liquidity loosening is at least as important to the dollar, if not more important than whether they drop interest rates. Why it's important for them to drop interest rates is that interest rates act as a, this, the, the policy rate acts as a reference rate for all the bank lending. So I'm saying that the bank, Interest rates are now too high for the state of the economy. And therefore, we need lower interest rates and we need that to transmit through the system relatively quickly. Otherwise, we will have, you know, a pretty stagnation will be the best case scenario. And we could have, you know, multiple periods of negative GDP, which could which would actually be a recession defined as a, as a negative quarters of the so that would be an actual recession. So that's why I'm suggesting that we now is the time to cut rates. And frankly, we're already a little late. Yes. 
That was a good question, Mrs. Eames. Um, Charles, did you want to add anything to that before I take the next question? No? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the comprehensive answer, Keith. Any other questions? Thank you for that, because I wanted to get to the exchange, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one else has any questions, I suppose I'll just sneak a final one in there. Um, and it relates to something. Oh, no, we do have one more question. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank Hello, you. good evening. I'm David Weir. The question that I have is really for, I would say, the person who can predict the elections that is actually coming up. That is a critical thing. We know that we have two totally diverse views as to how they think they're going to lead the country of the United States. Um, I just want to find out your thoughts on the best case scenario of a Donald Trump winning and how that would affect pretty much just really the, the, the given his thoughts on macroeconomics and how he will just concentrate only on America, how is that going to affect us on a global scale also? Thank you. I think we'll rely on Henry's crystal ball. Henry, you want to answer that? As the US citizen in the, <laughs> on the panel. He says no. He's in no, Washington, you know. <laughs> well, what Washington. I was saying no to is, is I am not a U.S. citizen. I am a Canadian and Brazilian oh. citizen. So oh, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So I, yeah, well, that, that, I, apology accepted. Uh, though my wife and four children are American citizens. So, oh, wow. um, I guess I guess I'm implicated. Um, look, I, uh, I can say a, th a few things, and I, I think I actually mentioned it before, so I'll get back to that. It's not a value judgment. I can't vote in the United States, uh, so you know uh, I have no I have no official opinion on on what the you know what what uh, an ideal outcome would be. But I do think that, and I mentioned it before, that it you know it de depending on the outcome, you could have a very different look, different path for fiscal policy going forward in the United States and and possibly you know, and certainly because of that the 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 interest rate path right uh, so back to sort of the fed rates uh you can look this up yourself and I don't pretend to be an expert but uh you know uh, one party is promising pretty significant tax cuts uh and tariffs uh, and other policies uh uh it's certainly the 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 tax cuts uh could be seen as, as as a precursor to a more inflationary environment in the future so you can think through the implications of one policy platform versus the other uh which 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 might be more traditional in terms of uh what what the policy dynamics look like uh and are actually talking about tax increases certainly on to, for some of the higher income uh, Americans. Um, so I think that there is something to consider there as it, as it relates to your, your outlook for U.S. economic performance, inflation, and interest rates. And I think, I think you know, at least if the, the current uh, candidates stick to what they are talking about in public in terms of economic platforms, and one never knows if that will happen, uh, but I think you could see two different, very different dynamics in terms of, of certainly revenue and expenditure policy, and as a consequence, also economic performance and inflation, uh, and then interest rates. Uh, so I, I do think that it'll be consequential. Exactly what it'll mean is not clear, but I, I, I think that there is something to that. Thanks, Henry. Anybody else? I, I, I'll take that. Um... I agree with Henry that it, you know you you got you got quite a different potential policy outcome, and so that actually I really probably should have prefaced my comments about the the, the U.S. stock market. Although, interestingly, that anyway, I mean, if we think it through, you'll have you could have well, probably will have higher tariffs, higher inflation, um, tax cuts. Um, that to, which could potentially offset some of the impact of of the um, higher tariffs, and also you could also have a less independent Fed, which is what is being talked about. Um, uh, in other words, as a goosey economy kind of you know, pressure to 
uh, you know, any let's call it pressure anyway, to to um, goose the economy a, a, a bit, uh, you know, to offset these other things. So perhaps a higher inflation outcome. Um, on the other hand, you may have, you know, it's likely that the, the the probably if the one another the other party wins, it's likely that you may not have the tariffs, or at least not certainly not what is talked about. But you may have a slightly tighter fiscal policy because the tax cuts don't get renewed, for example. Which so because because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about there's a tax cuts that were pushed in place, which are expiring next year. So if you don't keep, you know, taxes go back up if you don't uh, do anything. And presumably that the idea is that that cuts the, the fiscal deficit somewhat. I mean, it needs to be cut, frankly, um, because 6% is high. Um, so that are the, the choices and that could have different impacts on both the US stock market and the US bond market uh, quite uh, well, it would have quite different impacts, but it, it, this, there's a lot of uncertainty. So trying to forecast that is a very first of all, you know, it's a coin toss or it looks like a coin toss, and then you don't know what will actually happen. You know, they, people announce stuff, often it doesn't happen, and if you don't have Congress, you don't have the ability to do it anyway. So, um, so. So I would say that the, but the different scenario, so thanks for the question, because what it means, it allows one to, to, to note that there are different outcomes, significantly different outcomes that we need to consider. That's an important. This might be an, an easier question. We have had macro stability for quite a while in Jamaica. Could you look in your crystal ball if there's a change of government, what do you think will happen? Will they be able to maintain that stability? Excellent question. <laughs> Bringing close to Boy, me. these people are good. I know, they're really hard <laughs> they, questions. You have a good audience here. <laughs> I should have just you asked know? them for the panel questions. <laughs> they asked the right questions. Okay. You know, uh, I'll be very bold and take that one. I, that, I feel like you felt last, the last question, Henry. <laughs> um, look, my view is that the, you know, the, the, the PNP were there in the toughest por portion of the IMF program. That was a very, so yes, the, the shift the, the, there was an attempted shift in the in the, the JLP's term, 2007 to 2010. But if you actually looked at the, the level of the, the situation, it was extraordinary. Now, and you know, there's an argument they should have made a bigger debt. They should have done more on the debt side at the time. There's, you know, there's a number of arguments that can play. What anyone can't deny is that, you know, in 2013, Dr. Peter Phillips, working closely with a guy called Mark Golding, um, did a very tough fiscal adjustment at that time. Now, um, the good news is that, and that, you know, that, so that, if you like, the heavy lift, the, the really heavy lift, that was really, really tough. Now, what you've had since then is a continuation of this policy right up to the current date. Uh, and now, you know, debt, is, debt to GDP is in half, is half what it was. So that's, and you know, you've had, you've had a balanced budget right through, except for once during COVID, which is, a, which is an extraordinary by our yes. current, we have a current account, uh, you know, in balance. You've had a number of important reforms, fiscal commission, which is supposed to start next year. Epoch still continues to date. I actually think that they should incorporate the epoch into a social partnership and have us holding government to account to to stop just something of what you talked of what you're implying is to you know we don't want people to go wild in a in a new administration so i think it imposes 
a duty on all on civil society and the people here today and everybody to say we're not going we, we want our macro stability we want to retain that i i do not think that the a new government would say right out with the macro stability that we've had for which which was we paid such a high price right. to retain now it may be that they they want to spend a little bit more money that would not surprise me and but the truth is the situation now is a little different than it was in 2013 where we were literally in dire straits right. and really we've been in dire straits for a very long time in jamaica it's not a new thing <laughs> yeah. right we it's, it's just you know we've had high levels of debt right. now we don't so so or at least it's you know it's manageable now so i i, I would expect that there'd be pressure by civil society, by the media, by everybody to say, look, we can't, we're not, we're not going to go back to the situation where we start to, you know, pay 20%. I think it was, we were as high as 18 or 20% percentage, percentage of GDP and in interest costs. It's ridiculous. Now, now, now we're down to like six or five and a half. So, you know, a third or a you know, quarter, depending on which time you use. So, so we're in a very different situation than we were I would. Ex I don't expect a dramatic change, but there may certainly be um, different emphases, and and you know, and I think it also behoves everybody to say, all right, we've got a fiscal commission. Yeah, Do we want some form of epoch uh, social partnership incorporated in social partnership? You know, wait, mechanisms to try to make sure that no new government feels that they're going to just you know blow the budget. Right. And, and go back to where we've been in so, so many times in the past. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, I think that was a great answer, Keith. Thank you. I'm, I know Charles want, is happy he dodged the question, so I'll go to this uh, final question from the audience. Thank you. Okay. My name is Mikhail Thompson. We've heard of low levels of unemployment and a relative labor shortage. What effect do you think that will have on increasing inflation locally and affecting the BOJ's ability to reduce interest rates to fight the inflation? Basically, the effect of lower labor on increasing wages and inflation and how we I can go with that. that. I'll get, maybe Charles wants to go after. Charles? Charles? Yeah. Charles? I mean, OK. For the first time in my memory in Jamaica, and I'm older than I look, um, you know, the you've had labor shortage across sectors coming out of the COVID crisis. So you 4%, whether it's 4 or 5%, they, they, they just reclassified the unemployment rate slightly. But, you know, we've never had as low level of unemployment rate as we have now. Now, on the other hand, I think if you, you could say the problem has solved itself a bit because the economy is already flatlining. As I said to you, you know, you talk, the people are talking about layoffs in the tourism sector, you know, the construction sector is not, is not. So, so that period, which really was last year, probably, where there was a shortage of, everybody was complaining about a shortage of labor. I'm not hearing that so strongly anymore now. So there's still, it's still not that it's not that la the labor situation is you know unemployment has gone up really it's just that you know I don't hear that everybody screaming okay I can't find workers as they were towards the end of last year um, which was of course when we were still recovering uh, from from our situation so we're kind of now just going into what a, you know a sort of stalling thing so I think that problem if you could you could say is already solve itself. What I'm hoping we avoid here is a situation we may have seen in the past where, you know, the economy really starts to, to go down. And this is why I'm hoping the Bank of Jamaica cuts interest rates. I keep saying that, right? Um, so, right, right, Henry, I know you're a former central banker. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping that we avoid the situation where we see significant layoffs like we've in the, you know, sometimes we've seen in the past in certain industries, and probably we we will, and 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 you know, and not. I don't think the economy is going to fall off a cliff. It's just it's just that it's because normally that happens because of some macro instability, of which we've had a lot of. So normally there's a macro, big macro reason why 
our economy falls off a cliff in Jamaica. That's been our historic situation. Otherwise, we kind of flatline more. We're more of a flatline place, you know, we just, you know, you know, continue on in the flatline. So, so what I would say is that um, I, I, I'm not overly concerned about a labor shortage if the Bank of Jamaica cuts interest rates at this time, because we're already got a decelerating economy. And I think we're just trying to avoid it actually going negative. Kind of, it's almost kind of like the US, except we're not as well positioned as the, the you know, the US are trying to get ahead of, uh, you know, an economic decline, the rise, further rise in unemployment so for, for once, actually, because normally they're behind the curve, right? And we're, what I'm saying is we're a little bit behind the curve, but it's salvageable. And we're, and we're kind of, you know, because we're always flatlining anyway. So, so, so you like that, I see. Um, so, 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 you know, so, and I, so, I don't, so I'm not overly concerned about your concern. Hopefully that answers it. You sure you don't want to uh, 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 intend to this Charles one, Charles? Charles believe wages contribute to inflation. He says it's money supply. <laughs> don't have a go, Can Charles. I trigger uh, a response with that? No, no, I, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, worry about uh, wages pushing up inflation at, at the moment. Uh, and I think Keith answered the, the question very well that, you know, we're probably not in a situation now where there is a huge excess demand for labor. Um, which may not be a good thing, but um, that's the reality of where we are. Panelists, I'd like to thank you very much for your time this evening. Audience, thank you very much for your patience and your excellent questions. I would like to invite everyone to stick around for some drinks and food afterwards outside in the lobby. Carry on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Sterling Asset Management and our organizing committee, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude for joining us at our annual investor briefing this evening. Your participation has made this experience truly fulfilling. A special thank you to our VP of Trading and Investments, Mrs. Marian Rossamar, for expertly moderating our discussions. We also appreciate the valuable insights. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> From our president and CEO, Mr. Charles Ross, economist and columnist, Keith Collister, and Henry Mooney from the Inter-American Development Bank. I'm sure you'll agree with me that their insights and expertise, as well as the crystal ball, <laughs> has deepened our understanding of the financial landscape and shed some light on the complexities and the opportunities ahead. Together, we all engaged and asked questions and your reflections and contribution enriched our dialogue and underscored the importance of collective action for Jamaica's prosperity. We are grateful to those who tune in via the live broadcast on Nationwide with Cliff Hughes. This helped us to expand or reach beyond this gathering. A huge thank you to the organizing team, our AVP Michelle Valentine, AVP of Marketing, Ms. Michelle Valentine, our wonderful PR team, the Storyteller Agency, and Ms. Renee O'Connell, from the AC Marriott Hotel. Their hard work and dedication made this event a success. As we move forward, let us carry the insight shared today and work together to unlock Jamaica's economic potential. Let's continue to collaborate for positive change. Thank you all once again, and do enjoy the rest of your evening.